Okay, welcome back. Part two. Part two, part two. I, uh, I said to Joanne, in the English name Joanne, I don't know her Chinese name, uh, I said to her, I said, oh, what do you think we should do? It's different. And she, she said it was, it was really predictable what she would say, because it's always the same thing that gets said. And they say, ah, oh, can you say things more practical? Uh, more practical things. Try and concentrate on the practical things and not the theory things. But of course, that's always impossible because if, you, if you're doing practical, if you're talking about practical things, you're talking theory. Anyway, I will I will talk about some specific classroom things in a moment. Okay, let's just start at this point. What stops students learning? Boredom, rote learning. Drills, memorising. I just went through a walk just a few minutes ago, and we went up around the classrooms around here, and I walked along. I went up one flight of stairs, and I walked along, and I looked in the classrooms to see what they were doing. And I looked in four classrooms. Every classroom had a PPT showing. Every classroom had the teacher standing at the front of the desk. And every classroom, the students had their books on their, on their desks. And I looked at those students and I said, which ones are working and which ones aren't? Do you know something? Most of them weren't working. Most of them weren't. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. Right? You can't just sit in class and learn. You, you're, you're here now listening to this. You can't listen to a talk like this for an hour. You just can't. You're not human if you listen to this for an hour and remember everything that comes. What happens is if you pick up a little bit, then you have a little doze, a little sleep, a little snooze. You have your eyes open, but you just sit there. Right? And that's okay. And then you come back. And that's how people are. You need to think about those things. So what stops students learning? Well, boredom, rote learning, drills, memorizing things. They're the things that make for boredom. We'll talk about that in a minute. Meaningless material. I help a, a, a little girl. Um, she, the, the, uh, I, know, I know a family that have got a restaurant, and sometimes whilst they're making my dinner, uh, I help the little girl with her homework. And she's learning the meanings of English words. Right? And I tell her the meanings of English words, and she memorizes them. It means nothing to her. It means nothing to her. It means nothing. It's a really hard way of doing things. She, she, re she memorises what the words mean, but she hasn't got any kind of context for them. She hasn't got any sort of understanding of the world that those words come from and how they work. She just memorises them. And I, I'm a bit sad about it because I think it's a real waste of time, really. Uh, she'll memorise a whole lot of words. In five years' time, she'll forget them if she doesn't use them in some way. So learning without a goal, and of course, exams are the goals that are put in, which isn't a good thing, and fatigue, and just getting tired. People get tired, eh? And your students get tired, and you'll get tired as you're listening to this. So what demotivates students? Demotivates, same as bored. What do students find boring? Who's that? Michelle Obama, that's right. What, what's the girl's name? Yes, that, that's right. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Sasha, is it? Sasha? 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 Sasha. Okay, this is in Beijing. This is in Beijing. And you remember a few months ago that Michelle Obama, the president's wife, plus her mother, plus some of the, the girls, uh, they went to a show. And there they are in Beijing. Now look at that girl. She's in Beijing, they've taken her to a special place to show her something, and they're both watching it. What does the girl think? Bored. bored. <laughs> yeah. The girl's bored, isn't she? The girl's bored and tired, and, and actually she hurt her hand. She, she had some sort of accident and hurt her hand when she got to Beijing. So, so she's bored. And it's really important that you can look at a, a, a student and you can pick what they're thinking, where they are, whether they're paying attention, whether they're attending to what's going on, 
or whether they're not. And you can see that that one's not. But this one, hard to tell really. She's a president's wife. She's pretty good at pretending. Yes. Right? She's pretty good at pretending. She might be she might be real, she might not. We can't really tell. But uh, yeah, she's pretty good at pretending. Now, look at those ones. Now, there's a classroom. You must have seen that in your classrooms. So, who's doing what? All right. Well, let's start with this guy. Is he, is he learning very much? You don't think so? Okay. What are the things, what are the things about him that lead you to the conclusion that he's not learning much. If you think he's not learning much, I mean, you might think he is learning. I'm going to ask somebody over here. Look at him very carefully. Look at him carefully. This guy here. What tells you that he's probably not learning much? What are the things that you think? What sort of things do you look at about him that suggest to you he's not learning much? Anybody want to have a go? Don't all speak at once. What, what makes you think that he's not learning much? If, if you do, maybe you think he is learning. if you think that he is learning. If you think that he is learning. Some people do. Put up a hand if you think that he's not learning. I think I better say the question again. We're looking at this boy and he's sitting in class. Okay? Now I'm asking you what can you tell by looking at him about whether or not he is learning anything. Is he just is he learning something or is he not learning something? Can you tell whether he's learning something or he's not? All right. Now, if you think he is learning something, put up a hand. If you think he is not learning something, put up a hand. That's better. If you don't know, put up a hand. If you can't tell, put up a hand. Okay, I'm going to ask somebody right here why she thinks you can't tell. Uh, 呃，眼睛在看前方，然后只是想着，所以但是你不知道他是思考东西。Can I hear you? Can you? Oh, I'm right. Just quickly. Ah, okay. Ah, I think he, the look on his face, thinking, but you can't tell whether he's thinking what was the teacher saying or he was just thinking, uh, where to go next after the class for dinner. Yes. Yeah. So you can, I can tell. All right. Thank you. Anybody who thinks that he is not learning anything useful? Anybody who, who really thinks he's not? Would they like, uh, want to make a comment? Somebody who thinks he's not? I think he's not. Anybody want to make a comment? I think he's mainly asleep, actually, but... <laughs> okay, hang on a minute. Here you are. Uh, I think the, the boy maybe a little tired at this time and he's not listening to the teacher what the teacher is talking about but the girl next to him is serious about it's yeah yeah this one the girl is serious look at the eyes so bright but that eyes the, the boy's eyes almost slim almost but he he, he, he cannot because he's in the class i think if you if you, you close yeah he cannot I, if he's late, the, the teachers will be angry. 
I think you have to pretend to have the class. Thank you. Well, I uh, I had a class on Thursday night, last Thursday night, and these these were first year students at the university, and we had a little bit of time at the end of the class, and I wanted to give them a chance to practice their English. So I sat them around in a circle, they're only a little group, and I said to them, I'm going to ask you a question, and you must tell me what the answer is. And there was one girl there, and she looked pretty much asleep through the class. She hadn't been sort of paying much attention or doing anything. And I asked her a question, I said, what time did you go to bed last night? What time did you go to bed last night? The answer was three o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. So she's not going to learn much the next day. She was basically having a little sleep. Yeah, and it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. So uh, it's probably better with the smaller children like this, but the university students, they, they like to stay up, don't they? Okay, so he's interesting. What about this guy? He's reading a book, and we don't know what the book is, do we? We can't tell what the book is. What about her? <laughs> she wants to. She wants to understand. Yeah, she really wants to understand, but maybe for her it's a little difficult. Okay, that's good. We've got thoughts about that. Now, have a look at this one. The one with the, the fixed eyes. You see a lot of people like that in classes. You see a lot of people like that. Uh, there'll be people like that here if I look at them carefully enough. Can you tell whether she's learning or whether she's not learning? Is she learning? What do you think, Joanne? Could be I think she may be not learning. Uh, before I uh, read a book, when the eyebrows look uh, the left side, up left side, uh, it means he, she or he is thinking or remember something, thinking something. So I think maybe she is not really studying. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would be suspicious. Suspicious. I wouldn't be. I, I wouldn't be sure she's reading. She's, she's learning. Yeah, you can't be sure, can you? But, but we get a lot of students in our classes like that, don't we? They're looking at the teacher, they seem to be there, but the brain isn't with it. They're not really there. They just look as if they might be, and they know how to please the teacher, don't they? Right? That, that one there knows how to please the teacher. Right? And so she's pleasing the teacher, and maybe not learning a thing. Maybe. Can't be sure. Can't be sure. All right. So we've got some of them at the back. He's he's reading something. Whether it's to do with the class or not, it's another question. All right. It's really important that you practice this in your classroom when you're teaching. Look at your students. Look at these pupils, and just think that one learning, that one learning, that one learning, and and, and, and learn to get get used to them, looking at them one at a time in the eye. All right. Just, all right. Don't don't look at them. All right. Don't look at them all. Oh yes, there's the class. Because they're not class. They're they're one 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 one. And what that one's doing is different from what that one's doing. Different from what that one's doing. That one's taking a photo. That one's thinking about it. That one's looking at me. All right. What we got over there? <laughs> looking at me. Okay. So you've got to you got you got to. Uh, You've got to, got to learn to look at them, one at a time, one at a time. Now, there are some students. What do you think about them? Are they involved in their learning? They're not bored, are they? Not bored at all. I'd be scared stiff. I used to climb mountains a little bit. If you come from New Zealand, you climb mountains a little bit. Uh, I'm scared now. I can't can't do it like I used to. My wife laughed at me the other day when it was a few months ago now, and we were up on a bit of a mountain, not a terribly high place, and we went along, and I went, oh, I didn't like it, and uh, yeah. 
But look at that. You, you can't make a mistake. You've got to be very careful. You can't go stupid. You've got to think about what you're doing. They are learning. They are learning. And there's no boredom, is there? All right? So if you want to get your students doing stuff, just remember that. That's the sort of thing you're aiming for. Right? That's the sort of thing you're aiming for. So long as they're stuck in classrooms, you've got to be really creative to overcome this business of being in a classroom. If you're in a classroom, you're starting behind the game. You know, you've got disadvantages before you start. Any outdoor activity is going to be good. Remember we talked about curriculum, what you teach, pedagogy, how you teach, evaluation, how you assess. And you remember this, everybody knows this. I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand, supposedly. But you see, if you go back to that one, there's doing and understanding. Those people will understand much more about this whole business, won't they, than they would ever if they stayed in a classroom and read a book about climbing a mountain. Okay. Now I'm going to go a little bit quickly just through some of this theory. I just want to give you a kind of overview of the theory and then we'll talk about some more practical things. Teaching and learning in the West, two approaches to education, traditional approach and the modern way, okay? And that's the same in China really. These ideas apply to all students, all grades and all levels. This kind of thing that we're talking about, educational theory. Somebody said to me, oh, can you talk for the, about the middle school? And I said, well, what's different between the middle school and the primary school? Not that much, really. Or the university, for that matter. If you can talk about the theory of education, say, for primary school, you can talk about it for, for university, too. All right? The same stuff. Same stuff. Okay? So, there's various versions of the story, various ways, and then key people, William James of the traditional... And the side's been cut off at the bottom, you can't see the other one, uh, which is John Dewey. Not sure what happened there. Okay, so the traditional approach, our ideas about schooling came from the family and the army. Right? That's where we got our ideas about how to run a school. Uh, and then teachers became professional, and you have what's sometimes called the scientific approach, the needs of mass education, and William James. I mentioned William James, a great American theorist. If you want to know about the traditional ways of teaching, his book, which I'll show you in a moment, is really the one that sets it all out very clearly. It's quite a big book, it's two volumes. That's the book, it's called The Principles of Psychology, Volume 1. And that tells you all about the principles of psychology, the principles of teaching, really. Uh, and that's the traditional way. We won't talk about that. So, in the traditional way, how do you motivate your students? How do you capture their attention? Well, positive reinforcement. Reward for success. And I put their rubber stamps, and I'll come to them in a moment. The most important thing that you can have as a piece of equipment, as a teacher, is a rubber stamp that says, well done. Put up a hand if you've got a rubber stamp that says, well done. Good. Anybody else? Good. Anybody else? Oh, goodness gracious me. Right, you've got a job to do. You've got to go and buy yourself a stamp. An ordinary rubber stamp that says, well done. Or good work. Or excellent. And a little stamp pad. And every time you see a kid's work, you find something that looks okay and you go, stamp. Okay? Guess what? The child will take the book home, will show the parents, you're making a link. Okay? That's the most important thing you can do. If you haven't got a rubber stamp and you're not stamping kids' work, you're missing a big chance. A rubber stamp. Some teachers have stars, you know, they're little stars and you lick them and stick them on. I don't recommend that, I've never had stars, but I have used different rubber stamps. So if you have two or three rubber stamps, and sometimes teachers have animals, you know. Oh. Right? Happy little animals means good work. Right? Get yourself a rubber stamp and start rewarding your students. Students work for rubber stamps. I'll tell you something surprising. University students do too. University students do too. You put rubber stamps on their stuff and they love it. 
It's amazing. <laughs> All right. So rubber stamps. You must get a rubber stamp. You have to go out and get it. It shouldn't be too hard to find. Okay. Kind comments. Say nice things to your students. Every time you say a bad thing to somebody, you should make sure you say 10 good things. All right, your ratio of one criticism, 10 rewards, 10 positive statements. Okay? And, and it just becomes a way of life. Negative reinforcements, punishments, and negative comments, we won't talk about them. Okay, and two kinds of motivation, according to William James, external motivation and internal motivation. External motivation, something external to the task itself. And the main external motivation we meet is exams, right? And exams by itself, we've got people up there, over there in that building right now doing their exam. That's the secondary school exams going on right now, okay? And that's to get them in secondary school. It's nothing about learning specific stuff. It's nothing about saying this stuff's going to be helpful to you or going to be useful. All that's doing is to get into secondary school. Really, it's a waste of time. It'd be, it'd be, be cheaper and easier just to put them all in secondary school. Right? It's, it's a very good way of doing things. Put everybody in the course for a year, and those that fail, well, they stay back and the other ones go on. China seems to have a double system. If you do a university degree, and you've got a bachelor's degree, in, in a Western country, that means that you can go on to do a master's degree. No examination in the middle, right? So if you've got your bachelor's, you can go on and do the master's. You don't have to do anything else. That's what a bachelor's degree means. You're ready to do a master's, okay? In China, because it's been trying to limit resources, it's had, had to try and manage such a large number of first people, it's very strong on examinations. But it's meant that China's ended up doing everything twice. And you're doing everything twice. It's wearing everybody out, and it's costing heaps of money, and it's not producing the right stuff anyway. So, yeah, well, somehow or other we've got to fix that. And, and we shall. I mean, you can see it coming. So, so that's external motivation. And of course, internal motivation, motivation that comes from within itself. And the best example we had, those guys. Internal motivation, hang on or you're going to fall down, all right? They're not going to do anything stupid. That's much more serious than taking any exam. They're going to be right there with it. Okay. So, what's the big change? The big change is that we're now looking for students who are creative and thinking and original, and this means you've got to give them space. It's, a, it's a, Education is a way of life. You're not just teaching students to be learners in school, but you're hoping that they become learners for their whole lives, just like you, and they've got to keep going. They've got to keep going. Okay, and then John Dewey, who was very important in all of this. And John Dewey, very important American educator, but he actually wrote those two books, which are important, that we won't talk about. Oh, well, I might just say something like that. I mean, see that first statement up there in this book, How We Think? And it begins, thinking is like breathing. So you see, he's not saying of talking about teaching anymore, he's talking about children thinking. He says, right, we want children to think. We don't want them to learn A, B, C, D, E. We want them to think. We want them to have new ideas, to have bright ideas to develop themselves. And he said, well, what do we know about thinking? He said, thinking is like breathing. You just do it. You just do it. You're thinking, but you don't really know much about how you do it. The same way as you're breathing. You're breathing, you're thinking, it's the same sort of thing. All right? And reflective thinking, what, whoops, what we talked about before, is important. Reflective thinking, thinking things over, working things out. And you can't require it of students. There's no way, I've been talking to you earlier today about how I want you to be a thinking 
thoughtful teacher, but I can't require it of you. I can't make you do that. There's no way I can force you to do that. Nobody anywhere can force you to do that. It's entirely over to you. It's your decision whether you're going to be like that. You don't have to be like that. It's up to each and every one of you to decide for yourself whether you're going to do it. And Dewey was very strong on that. He said, you can't make anybody think. And it's the same for your children. You can't make them think. You can just put them in positions and into things where thinking comes forward naturally, where they're going to think in the same way as they breathe naturally. All we can do, right there, is set up the right conditions. <laughs> That's the word. Okay, so John Dewey, who was at Columbia University, he had a student, and the student became a leader in the new cultural movement in China. And Dewey arrived in China uh, just a few days after the 4th of May, 1919, which is a date that you will all know. So he arrived in China in a very exciting time. And that book there is about John Dewey in China, obviously, to teach and to learn. Now, he was there to teach his ways of teaching to the Chinese people, and he was there to learn from the Chinese people. And it's quite a good book, that. And there are his students. And what's interesting about those students, first of all, he got involved with China because some of the students, a couple of the students, um, went to Columbia University in America, and there were Chinese who were his students. And these students of his said, come to China. It's a great place. And Dewey did, he went to China. And he was only going to be in China for a year, but he actually stayed almost three years. Just like me, actually. I was only going to come here a year, and I'm just signed up for my third year. I was only going to be here a year, and I'm still here, so there you are. People like China. So, um, so there they are. Now those people there, these people who trained with Dewey in his school in China, right, and this is a university type school, they went on to become the heads of the universities, of the main universities in China, right? So the major universities in China, a lot of the people were trained by Dewey, and so you've got that influence in Chinese universities. It's not the only influence, but it's one influence. A lot of what China uh, said about Dewey in China is now controversial. A lot of people think he, he got it all wrong, he didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> Big mistakes all round, and I think there's some truth to that. But it, anyway, it's a good, good thing to look at. So, all right. And what does he tell us? Well, motivation related to the curriculum, to pedagogy and evaluation. You've got to think of motivation in terms of all of those. Internal motivation is best. Let them learn. If you want creative students, let them alone to learn. Child-centered, focus on the child, and we did that when we talked about those pictures earlier on, and the little girl, you remember number six over there? And encourage and support your students. So we've got those three things, and that's the traditional education, right? And what have we got? We've got the textbook, what you teach. You decide what you're gonna teach by what's in the textbook. That's no good. I told you that I gave up, I said that we're not having any examinations. I also horrified my class, I really upset a class of students, I'll tell you how. I had a, uh, well I can find one here, Urgh! Oh, it the class, I, I, I came to teach this class you see, and when I arrived they all had this textbook, they all had a textbook, and I looked at the textbook. And it was an American textbook, and it was about 10 years old, and they all had bought it. And there's the rubbish tin. The poor students that paid money for the book. And I looked at the book, and I said, look, this is no good. Straighten the rubbish tin. I said, don't bring the book. We're not using that book. If you can sell it, sell it. Get rid of it. Sell it. We're not using a book. That particular textbook, it was written in America. Why do people write textbooks? They write them to make money. They write them to make money, right? 
they, they're not in, in the workbook, in the workbook, in the video, in the DVD, and all the other. They write them to make money. They're not interested in your students. They are not interested in your students. They've never heard of you, but they do know that you might, you might pay money for them, and students might pay money. So, textbooks are awful. You must get away from textbooks. There's plenty of other sources of information. The internet's got all sorts of stuff. And, and, and the Chinese government might think they can block the internet. Ha, ha, ha. They can't block anything. So, that's, you've got it brought out. In a textbook, you might find a little bit that's useful. One textbook, another textbook, you might find another bit that's useful. All right? I don't have any textbooks with my class. So no textbooks. I'll tell you what to do. And students say, oh, what do we learn? I say, well, you're going to have to think. Good luck. You're, you're here to think. You're not here to learn. You're here to think. And when you've had some thoughts, you write them down. Wow. Big challenge. They're not going to write, write a lot. You know, they're not going to write a lot. They're only going to write 100 words, 200 words. But that's thinking. That's thinking, and it comes from them. And, you, and if you've got a textbook, they'll never think. If you've got a textbook, they'll learn what's in the book. You've got to stop them learning what's in the book. The only way to do it is to throw the book in the rubbish. So I tell everybody now before I even get them, they don't buy books from me anymore. They, they all like my class because they don't have to buy a book. It's cheap, so, so that, that's good. Okay. And of course in China, the examination dominates everything. So what are the three evils of teaching? The three evils of teaching, the three things that are bad in teaching, the curriculum ones, the evaluation ones, and the pedagogy ones. Curriculum ones, textbooks. The textbooks are your enemy. You must see textbooks as evil. Whenever you see a textbook, start with the view it's wrong. Start with the view that it's trying to sell you something and you don't want to know. Think, think. Think, right? Examinations are evil. They're the evil of evaluation. Try and minimize them. Get away from them. Argue against them. And that will force you to use other forms of assessment. Somebody asked me at the, at the break, how, if you don't have examinations, how do you assess the students? Well, they write a paper for me. They write a piece of research. They have to do something themselves, find things out and report to me. And wow, they find it hard. They find it hard. Some of them find it really fun and interesting too. All right? And we do have little tests, but they're little tests during the course of the, of the, of the term. We have little tests like in week four, week eight, week 12, we have little tests. So there's no, it's not that there's no evaluation, it's just that it's different. And the last one, pedagogy, how you teach, the evil? Desks. Desks! These things. Evil. Evil. If I stand here, this thing between us, can you see how that's a barrier between you and me? But I'm just a teacher like you are. So the first thing I did when I got here is I went and said, oh, evil, evil, evil. And I came over here and I got right up to you so you could see me and I could see you, right? Here I see you. 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 Right? I got up, okay? Discs are evil. Discs are bad things. We'll talk more about that. The harm done by textbooks. Well, first of all, they kill student motivation. Alright? Because it's all in the damn book. You get the book, you look at it for a couple of days, and then you're all done. So, you know, there's no mystery or excitement about the book. Secondly, they stop the teacher from developing. The moment you throw the book in the rubbish tin, it's on you. You've got to start figuring out what these students need to know. And now you're thinking about what to teach them. Not some strange textbook writer who's trying to make money. You. And what you think is much, much more important than what anybody else thinks. You're the only guy that knows the, knows the students. You're the only one. You meet them each day or each week or whatever you do. You meet them every day. You know them. You know what they need. And you can then respond to those needs. 
So you've got to get rid of these damn books. Okay. So they stop the teachers from developing. They freeze the curriculum. That book that I told you about, it was in its 14th edition. 14th edition. Guess what? It was the 14th Chinese edition. It was an English textbook for China, done 14 editions. I looked at the American version. That had done about 20 tradition, uh, 20 editions. I got the early ones. That changed a little bit here and there, not much. The China one was just smaller than the American one. There was no difference. It was the same text, just they, they threw out a few chapters, so the Chinese one was smaller. Right? That curriculum, what was taught, was decided by somebody trying to sell a textbook 20 years ago. And here we are in China still doing it. It's got to stop. It's got to stop. Right? You've got to stop this. Don't think because somebody's written a book that it's right. Think if somebody's written a book, it's probably wrong. And that you'll be much more accurate in that case. You've got to start thinking about it. So here we are. I have this book and I, I threw it in the rubbish tin. It was trying to have me teach in China stuff that somebody in America thought 20 years ago. What a load of rubbish. Okay. And of course, what I just said, the textbooks often give a foreign point of view. Nothing is more important than getting resources for teachers produced in China. Right? We've got to have Chinese stuff for Chinese kids. All right, and who, who's the best person to produce it? I'm looking at them. You are. You are. Not professional textbook writers. You know the students. You produce the stuff. You've got computers. You've got the internet. Same way as I put together this talk, you can put together your stuff too, and you build up your material year by year. And that's how you get it. You don't get it from ready-made from anywhere else. I want to talk a bit about examinations. That's a beautiful picture. That, that's the civil service examination candidates waiting for their marks. China's got the oldest tradition of examinations in the world, of course. I mean, this ch examinations in China are just so tightly bound up. Uh, very lovely. What are those? They're in Guangdong. See each of those. They found that they must have found that people doing examinations cheated. Surprise, surprise. People doing examinations these days cheat too. They cheat like you wouldn't believe. So to do your examination you got put in a little hut. So every one of those had a student doing an examination. They had a little hut, especially for examinations. Right? So that's, that's a great picture. I, I like that. It's terrific history. Harm done by examinations, well, they kill student motivation. They kill student motivation. I ask students quite often, I say, what exams did you do four years ago or three years ago? And they eventually figure out, and then I ask them, what did they learn for them? And they eventually figure out the book, and I say, well, tell me something that was in the book. They can't remember any of it. Can't remember any of it. They reinforce external motivation, i.e. exams. They make education unjust for students. It's really hard to mark an examination accurately and be fair to everybody. And, you know, I've actually been responsible for a government, uh, part of a government organisation like the Ministry of Education for this. So I know this. It's really hard. And there's a heap of injustice being done in exams. They're, they're like a lottery. They're like, you know, you pay your money and you take your chance. Uh, I'm not convinced at all that you get the right answer. However, that's where you get an answer. They waste time and energy. If all the effort that went into exams in China was put into real stuff, the Chinese economy would go up like you wouldn't believe. It would be amazing. It, it, all this work that goes into exams just wastes your resources, wastes your time. If you did real stuff, it would be different. Okay. And they focus on low order skills. What do I mean by that? Uh, we'll just come to that in a minute. But just a little joke. All your students are very different, aren't they? You got the monkey and the penguin and the elephant and the fish and, and the seal, I think, and the dog. So all your students are different. Every student is different. 
So you say to them, for a fair selection, everybody's got to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. Okay? Well, you see it, don't you? Please climb that tree. Well, there you go. Isn't that what exams do? They assume everybody's the same, and then they give them all exactly the same test, and then you wonder why the answer's not very helpful. When I said higher order skills, I was really referring to this. These are the low order skills, the lower order thinking skills, remembering and understanding. Right? And this is what you do if you've got a textbook. You remember stuff and you understand stuff and you ask a certain kind of question in an exam. Right? You ask a question and it's got a very precise answer and you can mark it. But it's more complicated if your students has to apply the information. This is what case studies are about in business courses. You apply the information. Analyzing, evaluating, and, and then creating. To be creative is a higher order skill. Now we want our students in China, I believe, and I think the government does too, to be creative, evaluative people. We need a different kind of worker in China. Just thinking of the Chinese economy, we are concerned about the quality of what is produced. The quality of what is produced. How do you get top quality service and top quality goods? You get it by a certain kind of person working in the economy who's thinking and aware and alive and can make innovations and can make changes and can develop things. Who's got the confidence to speak out and change stuff. That's the creative person up here. It is not the person down here who memorized the textbook. If we want the Chinese economy to go ahead, We've got to change the sort of people we're putting out from our schools. That's very, very important. So when you use a textbook down here and you have an exam and you stick with these low order skills, you're actually, in my opinion, this is my opinion, you're actually doing China a disservice. You're holding China back. We want China to go ahead and China needs to embrace this stuff. We want innovation, we want change, we want progress, we want new stuff. And your students have got to be the ones that produce it. Your students, it's in your hands. A little bit more on that same thing. These slides you'll be able to get.